this InspiredInsider.com interview, we have Travis Perry, he's founder of The Cord Buddy. He starred in the hit show Shark Tank. He talks about, literally, he was a month away from declaring bankruptcy, what he was actually doing at the time, what happened, how he came up with the idea of Cord Buddy, how he got big sales and pushed through even when he had knee surgery, some of the behind the scenes of what happened during his session in Shark Tank, and much more coming up now. And he does sing for us at the end. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business, how they accumulate sales. Here we're talking with Travis Perry. Travis developed the Chord Buddy to teach his daughter how to play the guitar, which he did in just a few months. Travis had 150,000 in sales in 18 months to start. Sales are now over $3 million and the people who have used it, John Rich, the Bryan Brothers, Jimmy Fallon, many others. He was on the hit show, Shark Tank. Travis, thanks for being here. Oh man, I appreciate uh, you allowing me to be on here. It's a pleasure, and you're one of, my, one of my favorites on the show for sure. You know, we get a lot of comments from people, they have tons of ideas, they don't know where to start. You know, they have uh, a current product or service, they can't get much traction, they're trying to see it grow. And sometimes they even have the fear, fear of failure, embarrassment with family and friends when they're starting something. And you're the perfect person to talk about going from that idea to that first sale in dollar and beyond. And I, before we get started, I like to include a fun fact. And fun fact about Travis is, which you may expect, but every morning he actually wakes his kids up playing the guitar. He wakes up at 4.30 actually, and wakes them up around 5.30 or six. Every morning, Travis. I wake him with a song. So what do you play? What's a typical song you play in the morning? Or do you change it up? Well, everything from Johnny B. Good to uh, to uh, Going Through the World to uh, Ely Requires. That's my, my five-year-old little girl. She requires that I write her a new song every morning. Wow. Yes. And to make up a brand new song every morning to wake her up by. And if I don't, he goes, Daddy, you did that one yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> She's a tough audience. Um, so, Travis, I remember on Shark Tank, one of the biggest values you had was keeping it American-made. Why was that so important to you? Wow, well, you know, uh, uh, the area that I, that I come from uh, in Dothan, Alabama, lost, lost so many uh, jobs, uh, big textile area here, and uh, uh, just lost so many. I, and I, and I knew that my product could be made you know, by our workers. There wasn't technology being used that, that we couldn't do here. It was, it was mainly a labor-based product and assembly uh, once the parts were made. And, uh, and there's no reason to sit anywhere else. So what was one of those people that you were thinking of that you wanted to give work to? Or what was happening in the area that you saw that was such a problem? Well. Uh, and, and, and two people uh, distinctly come to mind. One is Greg Davis, who is a childhood friend of mine that, that lost his job in the textile industry. Uh, he was a weaver, uh, and that, that, that went to Mexico, his job did. And uh, he was a guitar player, and he called me up and said, I need a job. And I said, man, I'm opening a new company. But I'm about the product, and he said, you can use me. And I said, sure, you know, we have a good worker. Second guy, Roger Yates, my plant manager, who actually worked for me in the real estate business before 2007. Uh, we all know what happened then. And uh, but Roger had was in one of my main salespeople in real estate, but he had a background in the injection molding industry, and I brought it his injection molded, and so I was able to rehire Roger as my plant manager for four days. Well. So what were you seeing in the area at the time when the factories and things were shutting down? Uh, you know, I, 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 I have, I'm very active in the community in, our, in, our, in, in, in my church, and we had many members of our church that were, 
you know, we have a food bank at our church, and I was looking on our, you know, needed list for food bank, and I'm seeing, you know, where the food's going, and I'm used to seeing it going to homeless shelter and things like that, and I'm seeing our food bank being depleted by our church members wow. that, were, that were out of work. Wow. That was, that was a real, real tough thing for me to see. It's a big eye-opener. What was, and we'll get some of the success of Core Buddy and how you developed it, but what's one of the low points you remember in business for you before Core Buddy? Well, I, I was in, uh, in real estate. I was real proud of my real estate business. I uh, um, had been in the music industry most of my life and moved to Duncan in 94 and opened a real estate office. And I finally had a real job, my dad would say. I was, I was out of playing for a living on the road. And I uh, had about a 25-man office at a mortgage company from 94 to 07. And then the mortgage bubble bursted. And uh, I, I was literally, uh, I tried to keep it open for like 18 months, spending 40 to 50 grand a month to keep it open. And I finally realized I'm a, I have a month worth of money left and I'm fixing to lose my home. And I actually went to a campground and reserved the spot or made sure that they had room for me to put my camper if I had to move out of my house. And it wasn't just you, though, right? Who, at that point, what was your family dynamic? Well, well, I had, uh, I had, uh, that was in 07, so I had, uh, I had two children at that time. Good some luck going to a lot of 10. But uh, I had a I had a newborn. Uh, Ely was, was brand new, uh, and uh, Brady was uh, she was probably seven, six or seven at that time. Yeah. So, when did you first get into the guitar? My mo- uh, well, my mother is very musical. My mother's family played. My mother played piano, fiddle, banjo, uh, guitar. Uh, and so I was raised uh, hearing my mother play, and I wanted I took piano for five years when I was a young kid, started in the first grade, but I didn't like piano. I always wanted to play guitar, and I, so she started teaching me guitar when I was 10 years old. Oh, wow. So what did your dad do? Uh, dad was a farmer. Uh, we farmed about 1,000 acres of land, had about 400 head of cows. We kept about 40 in a feedlot. Uh, so I was raised on a living, breathing farm. <laughs> so what's that like? What's your what's your daily routine look like? Well, uh, if you had asked me when I was doing it, I would have said it was probably the worst thing in the world. <laughs> now, it is the best thing in the world. It taught me such good work ethic. But we were up at 4 o'clock every morning. I had to go out and, and feed our 40 head steer lots with our feed lot. Uh, and then I was back and uh, took a bath, ate breakfast, got ready for the bus on the bus at seven o'clock. Got to school, come home off the bus by three thirty. I was back feeding cows by four. If we were uh, uh, had peanuts or, or corn that we were gathering or planting, I was on a tractor and I was on that tractor till seven o'clock. Came home, took a bath, did my homework, and was in bed by nine or nine thirty. <laughs> That's an intense schedule. Every every day, every day. I had seven nights off, uh, and that was uh, my junior and senior year. I'm sorry, I had ten nights off in those were ten football games that I played. Otherwise, I was working on the farm and at our family restaurant. Yeah. So at that time, did you know, what did you want to do at the time? I mean, you knew, obviously, like, I did not want to be a farmer because it's, <laughs> yeah. but what, what did you want to do? Well, and, and, and hey, nothing wrong with farming. I mean, golly, I, 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 I love it now, you know. It's not for the faint of heart, though. Well, it's not, and it's, and it's hard work, and, and it, you know, it, it wasn't my passion. It was my father's passion, but it yeah. wasn't mine. I, I have music in my blood. Uh, I live, breathe, and eat music, uh, and it's my passion, so I knew I wanted to do something with music. And I want to be a player, but I love to play. And we all have dreams of being a, a, a country or a rock star. But it wasn't so much that. I just, I just want to make a living in music, you know. 
know, whether it was a music teacher or in a recording studio or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, playing, playing in a band. I wanted to make a living in the music industry. So tell me about when you first came up with the idea. Well, I was 18 years old, and I drove from where I lived to actually, which was a place called Perry Store. My last name's Perry, so we had our own little community there at a four-way stop. And I drove an hour to Dothan, which is where I live now, and was teaching guitar. Had been teaching guitar for roughly two months, and I went to the, got it on the store, and I said, man, I need to quit. And he said, oh, the drive is too far, huh? And I said, no, drive okay. I said, I, I suck as a teacher. <laughs> he said, no, why do you say that? And I said, because I've lost about half my students within the first 60 days. And he laughed, and he said, Travis, he said, that's just the way it is. He said, uh, typically we lose about 70% of our students. Wow. And I went, wow, man. And I, so if you're happy with 50% uh, and I'm your best teacher, then we've got something broke with the way we're teaching. We should, when we say with a device that you could uh, press a button, learn how to do your rhythm, when you get that skill set down, then start removing the, the, the buttons. He went, wow, that's a good idea. You should invent it. So what made you think of that at the time? You could have been like, well, you know, we need a clip. How did you know at that you, that time you envisioned what it looks like today, which was buttons? Uh, it was a little different, actually. Uh, the end result is the same, is that you press a button and it makes the full cord. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually had it had it in my head that it would attach to the neck a little different. Actually, like a capo, atta- uh, uh, another name brand capo attaches the way I was seeing it. But uh, it still did, did the same thing, does the same thing today. It just attaches a, a wee bit different, uh, which is better the way we attach it now. Uh, so fast forward to recently, or, or you know, when you first started the idea, what prompted you to then get it going? Well, I, I lost uh, my real estate business, as I said, in 07. And uh, so probably about mid-08, I guess, I, I, uh, I went back to teaching guitar, uh, which was my passion, and I was teaching my own daughter. And uh, now understand, uh, when I had the real estate business, I had a house sitter. I had someone pick my kids up from school. I, I, I had it going on in the real estate business. I was making some pretty big money. So I uh, had, had a, someone pick, a driver pick my kids up, you know, take them to the sitter. Well. I lost all that. I, I so I had to pick my own kid up at school, bring him back to the music store I was teaching, and I was teaching Brady, who is my oldest, who's now twelve. She was probably eight at the time, uh, to play a song, and uh, she wasn't getting it. And she told me, she says, "Daddy, I, I don't want to play guitar." And I said, "Why?" She said, "Well, it hurts my fingers. It's frustrating. I can't get the, my rhythm hand to go with the chord hand." And I said, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> Uh, you're, you're in the majority, Brady, and, and uh, I said, but I had an idea 30 years ago of a magic device, I called it. You press one button, it makes a chord, you can play a song instantly, and I was teaching her Taylor Swift's 15, and I said, you can play this song instantly if only this product existed, and she went, wow, Daddy, if you'll invent that, I promise I'll learn to play it, and just like a mule kicking a country boy in the head, I went, wow. If it don't exist, why, why, why can't I invent it? So that started the ball rolling. So what'd you do first? I mean, obviously, no one's created this. You've never created something like this. What'd you nope. do? Uh, well, first went to Google, uh, and a lot of lot of information out there. By the way, on Google, you can research a lot of products. You can go to Google Patents. You can search patents. But I put in cord making device. I put in uh, guitar teaching make device. I put in all these, you know, phrases looking for something because first, if it already existed, I didn't need to invent it. And then if it did exist, I could buy it for Brady and hopefully she would use it and I could incorporate it into my teaching uh, as as a music teacher because that's what I I was, a music teacher. And, uh, but it didn't exist. So uh, I called Roger Yates, the guy that I hired as my plant manager. I said, Roger, I've got an idea for something. And we went to lunch, and I told him about the idea. And uh, Roger said, wow, man. He said, that's a 
that I, I think that'll work, you know. And he said, "Here's the guy you need to call." So I called that guy who owned the plant that did injection molding, who led me to a designer, and it's just sort of a domino effect. Uh, which it took me ten designers to find a designer that I wanted to work with. I flew from Austin to San Diego to Chicago, upstate New York, Orlando, Florida. Houston, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia. I went and met with designers all over the country, and for one reason or another, I chose not to use them, and finally decided on a designer in Indianapolis, Indiana, mainly because his son was trying to play guitar in the head. And when I interviewed him, he told me that. And he said, I would love to work on this selfishly because my son has quit guitar. He knew the pain of that. Yeah. 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 And so I so he, he has become my designer on not only the Cord Buddy but the Cord Buddy Junior which is coming out this year. Uh, other products that I've invented. So he he's been my go to man for as my designer for all our new products. Show people just I wanna continue with the narrative and talk about it, but show people the Cord Buddy just for a second. Okay. And I and again I'm gonna ask you at the end about well, playing something, but, the, but just so people it, get an idea what it is. Yeah, it goes on your guitar. It just goes on. You've got this screw, so it squeezes onto the neck, and you press a button, and it plays a perfect chord. Uh, it plays G, D, C, and E minor. And so uh, you can do, you know, lay down your head, top to me, lay down your head and cry, lay down your head, top to me, poor boy, you bound to die. Will you call me at 5.30 and wake me up with that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you really want to. Uh, I would love to. But, uh, but you know, the, the, the bad bit with Chord Buddy is you're able to play a song instantly, you know, and then as you learn your rhythm, see, you start taking it apart. And now you're really playing that chord. You're not pressing a button anymore. Some people might even say you're not cheating anymore, you know. And then you remove them all one at a time, like training wheels on a bicycle, until you don't need it anymore. And you have a quit, you haven't got frustrated, you've been playing songs from day one. I got a great email here a while back from an 82 year old man who sent me a letter. He said, I've always wanted to play guitar, I've never been able to, and I wanted to play Brown Eyed Girl on my 50th wedding anniversary for my beautiful brown eyed wife. Wow. He bought a chord buddy and he played Brown Eyed Girl. Oh, yeah. A brown eyed girl. You know, I which I didn't do the whole song. But, That's great. But I, and and he told me how powerful that was for him to be able to play yeah. Brown Eyed Girl for his fiftieth wedding anniversary. Yeah. So for you, what was it like early on? You know, when you have a new product, it's not always easy to get it in the marketplace. Uh, Tell us about um, when you first get, you know, try to get it out there. Well, uh, in the early days, it was uh, me on the road uh, in a van uh, with Ford buddies and uh, Roger Yates, my plant manager. And that's uh, he was he was plant manager. He was the plant supervisor. He was everything. I was just one guy. And then a lady that, that answered phones, a retired lady that uh, that went to my church that I hired to answer the phone, should we get a call? And I was just literally staying on the road trying to get music stores to give me 10 minutes to show them this amazing product that would, that would revolutionize the way their students were learning guitar and, uh, and not being very successful. Because I can tell you, the last thing a music store owner wants to hear is the latest, greatest product. Because they hear it every day. Every sales rep that calls them up, they've got the latest, greatest. And they don't want another product on their shelf, you know, because I, hey, I owned a music store for a while, and I could, I could stock my shelves every week with new products that's coming out, you know. So, so uh, instantly the, the guard goes up anytime you say, hey, we've got a new product. You know, they w a store wants to stick with tried and true products. Right. So trying to get them to take a chance on a brand new product, especially something like Cord Buddy that's never existed, uh, was, was tough. So how do you differentiate yourself? Because a lot of people you know, want to get their foot in the door. What'd you do? 
Well, uh, uh, relentless. <laughs> I was relentless. Uh, I would I would keep going back, and, and I would call and I say, man, I, you know, you really need to look at this product. And, uh, I would just you know, and and, and you know, sometimes uh, you do have to give it the ghost, but not many. I mean, I, I'm like a bulldog. I, I just you know, if I if I knew there was a chance, although they might not have time that day, or they might have been out sick. I would stay over in a hotel in, in two or three days until I could see the person I needed to see. And at the time, you, it wasn't just, you actually had surgery, right? What did yeah. you do against doctor's orders? I did. I had just had my first knee surgery. In fact, I've had two now, and the reason I had my second one is because I went on the road uh, within a week of having surgery, and I was having to, to uh, I climbed what, what I think hurt it the second time, I climbed two flights of stairs to see a buyer. And uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm talking about crutches up the stairs with a cord buddy, you know, and then got in there and the guy told me, he said, I don't see anyone without an appointment. And he he I, said what? What did he say? I don't see anyone without an appointment. And uh, uh -huh. I said, well, I, uh, I've driven four hours to see you. And, uh, and they told me downstairs that you were up here and they said, well, I'm sorry. I, I don't have time to see you today. And uh, so uh, uh, four hours down the tube, a knee surgery gone. <laughs> what was the time when you did first got your big sale that excited you? Uh, you know, oddly enough, the same company. Uh, he, this guy was the buyer. Uh, and the buyers are not evil people, but they're gatekeepers to the owners uh, because of they do see so many new products. And I actually uh, called um, the, the owner of the store and got him on the phone like a miracle. And I said, listen, I've got this product I want to show you. And uh, he owned several stores. In fact, he was buying out a store. And he said, tell you what, uh, I'm at this address. We're buying out a huge store. If you want to come over here, I'll look at it. But I only got 10 minutes to see it. Man, I flew over there. I got out. I ran in and he's going to move this piano here. Okay, load that truck up here. I mean, he's just hollering orders. I'm following around like a little puppy. You know, I've got my guitar. And, and he goes, so, so what's your part to do, son? And uh, so I'm, I said, well, you press a button and you play. And okay, move that piano. I mean, it was just a nightmare. I mean, it, I felt so small. And uh, finally, he, he said, he says, all right. He says, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, I'd like for you to take 20 cord buddies at each store and I'll sell them to you at this price and I'll give you 30 day net and uh, he said tell you what I'll do I'll take 10 cord buddies at each store and I'll pay you this price for them and I will and you, you give me 60 day net wow. with one condition by January 15th you've picked up every cord buddy that hasn't sold and I said deal to long story short this, at the end of January, he had sold over 500 cord buddies. Wow. He was then calling me going, hey, Mr. Perry, I need more cord buddies. I mean, I was his best buddy then. What do they sell for? Uh, they, they retail for forty nine ninety five. Okay. And you get a cord buddy, you get a, a song book with a uh, with a hundred and a hundred and six songs in it. Uh, you get a, a, a lesson plan book and a DVD, and you get all that for forty nine bucks, so less than the price of what two private lessons would cost. You you get all that. So, and I know one thing is about you is you strike me on the show. You're just a family man, and you create a couple things for your kids. What did your little girl tell you? <laughs> well, uh, this was about golly, I'm guessing because we're coming. Uh, over a year ago, I don't remember the exact date, but over a year ago, the, my, my, my middle girl, I mean, with my youngest daughter, my middle child, the one in the red dress, her name is Eli. Now, the original product exists because of Brady. Right. Well, I, my, my Eli comes up to me and she says, Daddy, do you not love me as much as Brady? And I went, you know, I, I, I was almost devastated. I said, Brady, Eli, why would you say that? She says, well, you invented Brady a guitar, but you haven't invented me one that I can play. 
And I went, Ely, you're right. I haven't, but I promise you I will. So, coming out for fourth quarter, in fact, it will be here, is the new kids' guitar. It's a real guitar. It's not a toy. It has a spruce top, rosewood grid, rosewood neck. It has a truss rod in it. And it has a clip-on cord buddy that just clips on to a new patented nut that I've been. It is the first and only playable guitar for the four to seven year old age age group. Yeah. Of which parents, I call them Mama Mama Joey's, they buy tens of thousands of, of toy guitars every year because they see little Joey get from a mirror with a broom. And they go into the music store and they go, Hey, I want to buy a guitar and they how's your kid? He's five. Well, there isn't one for little Joey at age five until now. And, and they'll be able, when they unwrap this guitar Christmas, they'll be able to, with the chord buddy attached to it, to instantly play Jingle Bell. Yeah. I mean, that looks like a beautiful guitar. How, I mean... The real guitar, I mean, I mean, let's... I mean, it's a real guitar. It's not a, it's not a toy. So how do you go from making the chord buddies, now you're making guitars? How difficult is that? It was, it was, uh, well, what was difficult is finding a manufacturer uh, to, uh, that would maintain the quality at a price point. Uh, the same with all our, our other products. And hey, I did not want to be a guitar manufacturer. That was the last thing I wanted. I did not want to become a capo tuner manufacturer. But when I researched the market and I'm looking for products that, that people that are learning to play the guitar need, the quality wasn't there, and if the quality was there, the price wasn't there. It right. was above the price that a beginner would pay. And so I just saw these voids, and I said, wow, you know, I uh, can't buy a guitar for under $200, you right. know? I mean, that's not an arm and a leg, but it is to, to some people, you know? And so our guitars are, are they 119 bucks, you know? And it's a very quality guitar. Uh, we make 16 different models of guitars. So I want to talk about Travis too. Um, I'm curious about your experience in Shark Tank. And what was the toughest part? Because I know everything um, on there, or we don't see the, everything that gets aired. What was the toughest part of being on there? Well, uh, you know, probably just really being on there. It's, it's very nerve wracking. Uh, see, I was actually on the set for an hour and 20 minutes. Wow. In fact, I was told by the producer that it was the second longest time anyone had ever been in the tank, they call it, in, out there in front of the sharks. And they, they edit that down to about 12 minutes. Uh, and then if you do a home package, which they did on me, where they came to Dothan and they shot my home and, and shot me and my surroundings, so to speak, uh, which is about another 90 seconds so they edit 120 I mean I'm sorry they edit a hundred minutes down to 12 minutes so that so a, a lot gets you know a lot the viewer at home just doesn't see in the negotiation process so what didn't we see that uh, was important well and, and, and honestly some of it's boring uh, that gets into uh, stock options and uh, voting rights uh, proxy votes, things like that, because, see, the sharks, they, they, they're not going to be in your plan every day, you know, if, if you have stops that they'll mm -hmm. buy, they'll be proxy voters and away voters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a, a lot of that, some, just some of the, the, the business end of it stuff, and that, that's uh, my only uh, part that, that didn't go well is I misunderstood a question from Mark Cuban and uh, answered it wrong. Uh, and I answered it right as far as what I thought he asked me, but he asked me something totally different. What, what did he ask? He, had, he asked me, he wanted to know how, but he, who owned the most shares of stock, in, in which I do. I, I own the majority of shares. And then he, he wanted to know then how my vote, you know, how I would vote. And I said, well, I vote the way I want to vote. And, and, um, and then that, I said, that's just, you know, I vote my heart, you know. And then the other directors can vote, vote what they think. He says, well, if you own the majority of stock, uh, then then I'm out, you know, because then my vote won't count, in, in essence, is what he's saying. 
which is untrue. Our company is, I have no more power, even though I own the majority of stock, then I have no more power than any other board of director has. Mm -hmm. I'll have equal voting rights. And it has to be set up that way. You're not going to get any investors. <laughs> right. So if you answered it like that, how you, you know, how, what the actual question was, you'd think there'd be something different in that conversation? Well, yeah, I, I, I think Mark would have placed, made, made an offer, uh, but, uh, but because I, he thought that I was, uh, that I could take his you money. You could overrule I, it. Yeah, yeah, that I would just take his money and do whatever I wanted to. With him. Right. And he had no say so with it. I gotcha. What was an interesting interaction with the Sharks? I'm sorry? What was one of the interesting interaction that you had uh, when well, you were on the show? Uh, Kevin uh, is, uh, you know, like him or love him, Ke uh, Kevin is Kevin, and he's very opinionated. And to, uh, to, to for my product, I knew that if I couldn't win Kevin, chances are I couldn't win the other Sharks because he's the musician of the bunch. And they all sort of look to him if it's a music product to is this product worthy type thing. And then if he sort of gives the okay it is or yeah I think it's cool, then they'll go to the business side of things. And uh, so I knew I had to win Kevin. And and uh, he did not like it to start with when he saw it. He said he said you know so you're pressing buttons. How does that even you know how does that even help you learn to play? Isn't that just cheating? And I said wow man I sort of knew you was going to ask me that question, and I'm glad you did. And that's when I was able to pull this out. Right. It showed that there's a training wheels type aspect to it. Right. And when I did that, he went, oh, wow. Okay, so you can pull it out and actually learn in steps. He said, wow, that's probably the best way of, of learning I've ever seen. Yeah. And when he said that, I went, cha-ching, I've got it. Yeah. Uh, then all the other char sharks said, if Kevin loves it, it's got to be a great product. What was some of the good and bad about being on Shark Tank? Uh, well, all one and the same, I guess. Uh, the, the bad is that you're seen by millions of people. The good is you're seen by millions of people. And uh, if you're going on there and you have a website, if you have a... Well, don't go on there, really, I would say, unless you have a product ready to sell because you're sort of wasting your... your uh, presence or your your introduction to, to you know 10 million people uh, and have your website set up with load balancers and servers and all this stuff to handle tens and tens of thousands of hits because if you have a product that people like they will google you as soon as the name is said they start googling it and if they like it they're gonna place orders and we've been on there six times and six times we have had some failure uh, in our website chain from front end to shopping cart back end. Wow, that's painful. It, it is, you know, to, to uh, you know, it's like the Hail Mary, you know, you got three uh, receivers in the, in the end zone and it's the last play of the game and you throw it up and, and they drop the ball, you know, and same thing, I mean, you're on Shark Tank, it's, uh, you stand the chance to literally make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Literally, I mean, that's not exaggerated. You can make, I made $175,000 the first night it aired. Wow. 175 grand. And still had a, a, a uh, failure in my website. So, so spend the money, hire you an expert to set your website up, do load test out the yin yang until you're confident that your product will uh, sustain, you know, at least 50,000. Yeah. So, a technical question. Do you know what they did to make it not go down? Well, you know, it, it, it was a different thing each time. Uh, the first time, uh, well, and we six times, but I can tell you the last time we had enough gigs for the front end, but we only had four gigs allocated to the shopping cart, which was an oversight on our, on our uh, hosting company. And uh, I mean, they had a hundred gigs allocated to the front end and four gigs on the back mm -hmm. end. Duh! I mean, if they can't get in the shopping cart and buy, what good is it? And it took them forty minutes to add thirty more gigs to it. And once they did that, 
It worked or, fine. I mean, in literally every second. But we lost 40 minutes of the valuable yeah. time. Yeah, and people always ask those technical things like hosting company, things like that. What do you recommend? Well, uh, I can tell you who, who we've been using. Uh, we've been using Rackspace. And, okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're one of the, probably the big three in the world. Right. Big and all the other. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, hey, everyone's human. Uh, you know, they, they, they can make a mistake. Uh, and it probably be a bunch of money. I want to go back through a second. I had a question about how many prototypes did it take for you to do before you actually came up with that cord body? Because it's not a, it's sort of a complicated process. It is. Uh, this is actually a real prototype right here on our new cord buddy junior that we're coming out with. Uh, for the cord buddy original, 17 actual prototypes, and they're pretty expensive. They're between 500 and 750 dollars wow. per prototype. Now since since then we've actually made one, two, three, four, four, five, six. We made seven changes to the mold even since we've been on the market. Now, wow. That didn't require prototyping. We just knew certain things had to be done to the mold to make it, the product function better. So we've counting the, the prototypes, twenty four revisions have been made since the very first one. Wow. So the other question, Travis, is you know, someone right now, they may have a product, they may be thinking of a product, um, they may just want to get their first sale. What's the best advice you'd tell someone to do, the audience to do right now? Well, you know, if you're looking for investors, if, if it's a product that's going to require any type of investment, and uh, if you're thinking about going on Shark Tank, it probably does, uh, do, do a a product search, do some R&D, make sure there's a need for the product. And when you go to your investors, uh, ha have a three-year game plan for them because they it don't matter what the product is, they want to know what's going to happen to their money. And so have a game plan. Just don't have an idea. That's that's. I get so many people call me up with a great idea. Hey, what do you think about this idea? You know, I said, good, it's a good idea, great idea. Where's your, where's your prototype? Where's your market research? Have you sold any? Have you done any packaging? What's your marketing plan? Oh, I hadn't done that. You know, have, have you even gone to Google Patents to see if it's a patentable idea? Is it something already out there? Uh, I don't know. So get beyond the idea. Everybody has a million dollar idea. Everybody. But it's what you do after the idea. Yeah. So I know that you've not just relied on Shark Tank, you've done other things. What other systems do you use in your business to, to drive traffic and get people to know about you that's worked? Well, we do traditional marketing, radio, TV. Um, we do uh, one thing that we're getting more and more and more into is social media, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, outside of doing it business, I never go on it, but I can tell you I spend probably two hours a day, myself, not, not including other people that I have that's on there as well, looking at Facebook and Twitter, it becomes so huge that you you can't overlook, uh, can't o overlook social media these days. Yeah. Huge mistake. I'm 52 years old, uh, and, uh, and if I'm that in, entrenched and know that it's that important, I'm a redneck from Alabama. <laughs> well, then it must be important. <laughs> and you're all over YouTube also. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. YouTube, just as huge. Uh, uh, I do a lot of videos, as, as you've seen yourself. I have uh, people that buy cord buddies. And, and another thing, you know, make yourself available. I've seen so many people, and, and sadly it's happened to some of my Shark Tank uh, people. Once they get on there, it's like, okay, Cuts down, you know, you can't get them, you can't contact them, they take their numbers off the website. If someone wants to contact me, they can. All they have to do is email me and I will respond. Yeah. We forget that it's that person watching the TV or that saw the ad that bought the product. That's why you're in business anyway. Yeah. 
And I have one last question for you, Travis, before I ask it. What tell us a little more about what's exciting now, what's going on with Cord Buddy? Tell people what to expect in the future. Well, we, uh, we've got new products coming out. Um, we've, we're going to be on QVC this year. We're, uh, we've got a new product uh, coming out for fourth quarter that's a Duck Dynasty guitar. It's a kid's guitar. We'll have caricatures of Cy, Phil, Chase, and Willie on it. Uh, we've got a new product that turns your guitar into a speaker coming out. Uh, We've, we're in Guitar Center now, the Walmart of music stores. Golly, I mean, there's, so we're with Hal Leonard, the largest publishing company in the world, has wrapped their arms around us and, and uh, taken our entire product line on. You know, last week, we were the number one selling music product on Amazon. Wow. Yeah, we were the number one selling product on Amazon. That's amazing. So we're people... Music product. Music product. Yeah. Where can people find out more? What's the website? And if people want to reach out and thank you, how can people do that? Well, the website is Chord, C-H-O-R-D, B-U-D-D-Y, ChordBuddy.com. Uh, I'm Travis at ChordBuddy.com. Great, Travis. And so I have two last questions. <clears throat> One is, obviously, we have to hear a song in full effect. Okay. And, and, <laughs> The first thing is, I didn't even ask, how is it like, what's it like working with Robert? You're, I mean, he was the one who invested you on Shark Tank, right? Yeah, yeah. Robert has been, uh, i tell you what, I cannot say enough good things about Robert. You know, when you go on there, you, I sort of know my place in, in, in the circle of where they are and where I am. I mean, to not put it too crudely, but I'm sort of like a gnat on an elephant's butt compared to where he's at. <laughs> he's, he's the elephant, I'm the gnat. Uh, but I have been so pleasantly surprised. Anytime I need Robert, I email him or I text him. In, unless he's in Europe or Brazil or in a huge board meeting or filming Shark Tank, he'll respond almost instantly. Wow. And, uh, he's he's done so much. He talks about Cord Buddy in every interview he's in. Uh, he's given me so much good advice. I, I seek his advice all the time. And uh, in fact, I just got an email from Barbara. Uh, you know, she was uh, judge on the uh, Miss America pageant, and uh, so I, I, I sent her an email. I said, "Hey, Barbara, when they showed you, I thought you were one of the contestants." So <laughs> Barbara, she texted back, "You so and so, so and so." So the relationship I built with some of the sharks uh, and Lori Grenier as well uh, on QVC that I'm going on as uh, still surprises me to this day. So what's one of the best piece of advice that Robert's given you so far? Passion. Passion. Uh, if you know Robert's backstory, his dad was a janitor, you know, growing up. Uh, and, uh, and I tell my kids the same thing. I don't care if you want to be a janitor, if you want to be a ditch digger. I don't care what, what you want to be. Be the best one of those you can and have a passion for it. Have a burning desire. Daddy told me this, and a lot of people say it, if you love what you do, you'll never want your day in your life. And it's so true. I literally can't wait to get to work every morning. Hear people say, oh, I think I gotta go back to work Monday, you know, and I'm going, man, I get to go back to work Monday. He told you that, but you seem to have a passion for music. Well, he did, but to see it, you know, with someone like Robert. Then another thing he told me that, that really meant a lot to me. And, and he said one of the best things that he liked about me is I didn't use Shark Tank as the end all be all. He said a lot of people come on Shark Tank and they think that they're there. He said every time I talk to you, you're asking me, all right, Robert, we got this new product. Here's my next step. What are, what are our next strategy? He said it's always you are looking to the next thing to advance your company. Yeah. He said, that's what I like about you. If you only view Shark Tank as a stepping yeah. stone to get your end result. Yeah, I do notice that a lot with you is you're listening to your customers. You're saying, what do they want next? They want the kids, kids guitar, the kids core body. You're not just stopping at that one product. You're seeing, you're kind of reaching out and seeing what is the market like? What are people wanting from me? So that's really 
and it's not easy. You're like coming up with manufacturing guitars. You know, you just kind of say it, and that takes a whole lot of time and energy and money too. So, and uh, you're right. And then and then you wonder, well, just because you know, I thought it was a good idea, and I had people tell me, "Golly, I'm I'm, I'm dumping one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars into the first guitar." Order, you know, so so you sort of sort of sort of nervous until you know, and we. Thank goodness we sold every one of them. In fact, I've got uh, brand new guitars that should be here in two days uh, yeah. because we're out. We're totally out. Yeah, it's a good problem to have. So yeah. obviously, the last question I'm going to ask is: We need to hear a song. Okay. And since you're from Alabama, would you uh, do us a number? Well, I will, and I and I, I wouldn't be doing me or my state justice if I didn't <laughs> do my favorite song, and that is Sweet Home Alabama. Sweet Home Alabama, Lord, I'm coming home to you. Ah, oh, yeah. Sweet Home Alabama, with skies. Awesome yeah. Love it. Thanks, Travis. It's an absolute Thank pleasure. You. Thank you for taking the time. Everyone oh. check out cordbuddy.com and I really appreciate it.